here we go. Um, so I was in this part of China, Shanghai is here, Kunshan is where I was based. I did some travel all the way up here, Beijing. Um, this is where, if any of you remember, Wang Jingguan, who was here last year as an LLM. This is where she lives and teaches. Xi'an, uh, down here to Shan Shishe. I'll show you some pictures of it and then back to here. Kunshan is where the university is. Duke University has created a whole new university in China. And that's where I was based. Um, but, you know, in terms of, and just geophysically, geographically, China has 14, more, four to 14 sovereign states. We in the United States, as you know, only two. And that makes a big difference in terms of just thinking about how China views where it is in its world. So part of the talk today was talking about challenges and opportunities. So what are the opportunities for Maine law students, for Mainers, people in Portland generally, the Americans generally, China? Um, so I've lived in Maine for 40 years. Coincidentally, 40 years ago was the Cultural Revolution in China. They just, um, they just celebrated 70 years, really, from 1949, while I was just leaving with the 70th anniversary. But the transformation of China in 40 years is truly remarkable in terms of any aspect of its society that you can think of, and you'll see some of it. But right now, it's, it's the, you know, the world's largest economy. And even compared to the European Union, the growth rate through 40 years, the 9.5%, has never been come close by anybody else. And they are slowing to around 6%. I put quotes around slowing, they are deliberately trying to slow their economy, not just because of the trade wars or anything else. We're, we're at under 3%. Um, skyscrapers, if you want to do real estate, construction work, they are building uh, everywhere and, and quite a bit. And you can see how and they build tall buildings. This was, this, I took this picture from one of the towers there, that's Shanghai. And that's just a part of Shanghai, which is 25 million people. Um, which is not the biggest city in the world, it's the third biggest. So now we start our A, A to Z. Um, so for attorneys, they, uh, they've changed how you become an attorney uh, as of last year, and, and it can include getting work experience. The bar exam pass rate, um, if you think, you know, in the U.S. is challenging, it's a lot more challenging in China. Uh, compared to our first time pass rate in the U.S. is almost 75%. So it's very competitive, as well as getting into both law school and university there. China is not over lawyered, it's a huge country. What's interesting, the U.S. is number two in the world for lawyers per 100,000 people to Israel. So we're pretty high, China 16 per 100,000, the U.S. 396. So there's still room for a lot of room for lawyers and legal work in China. And China's legal system is truly evolving day by day. Um, there's a lot of aspects of it similar to the US, but they are still there studying what we do here in many ways, including our legal system and our environmental system and, and business systems and everything else. The is for beverages. Um, interestingly, by the way, they may know why spirits are called spirits. The spirits are other than those ghosts out there that <laughs> New York Jets quarterbacks see. Um, spirits are because it's the vapor that comes off the fermentation process of making alcohol, so it's also liquor. But in the US, we primarily drink beer, they drink spirits, and the number one spirit in the world um, is in those containers, Beiju, which um, if you go over there and, and somebody treats you to dinner, they will order that and then they will try to drink you under the table. So <laughs> it's part of the hospitality of, of China. Um, and they also have the best selling beer in the world called Snow. There are a lot of people in China, it's only sold in China, but um, that's part of their society. Cell phones, they have a, a, a growing penetration rate. Everybody assumes everybody is connected in China and in a way they are because you can't, cash is almost extinct, which was a problem for me because I could not use my cell phone digitally to pay for things because I did not have a work visa. 
Um, we have a lot more cell phone penetration here, but it is growing rapidly in China. So I'll read this because this was a sign I saw, and it's interesting because it sort of conveys a sense of, of the people in China, the citizens' basic moral norms. Patriotic and law-abiding, courtesy and honesty, solidarity and friendliness, diligence and self-reliance, devotion and dedication. You know, there were a lot of signs like this you would see. And, and, it, and I, I mention it just because um, there's a lot of reinforcement there as to how they want people to behave. And people really do treat each other well. And I never had one moment of hassle when I was there. Stress, yes, but not hassle in terms of how people responded to me. And many, many, many times I was in places, crowds, and everywhere else where I was the only Westerner there. Um, this is a classic dining out scenario. This was a dinner that I was going to with uh, faculty from around China for a climate change litigation conference. Round table, it moves, it circulates so that dishes are put on the table and then people start swirling the table around. You take some and it just keeps swirling around uh, by hand as well as the alcohol and everything else that goes with it. Um, drinking water. Okay, we take things for granted here, but you can't really, you can't drink the tap water there. You can brush your teeth, unlike Peru, where I did that barely once, brushed my teeth and I was sick for a week. Um, but it's interesting when you think in the US we have clean water all the time, but actually 90, it's only roughly 90%, which is good. It's just there are seven to 10% of um, water systems in the United States that are below average and not acceptable according to EPA. And uh, this is where I was based, so it's hard to see because this was a panoramic picture I took. This was all built within the last three years. And this is just part of the campus. They have freshmen and sophomore undergraduates. They are gonna build, they have 550 students there now. They're gonna be up to 2,000 in a couple of years. The number two person at the university used to be a Bowdoin College anthropology professor, tenured, who went there. And in his second year, he's vice chancellor. He's hiring 40 new faculty this year. 40. Um, so they're going to—they're growing. They're building a whole separate new campus right next door. So I was taking this picture from my office building where I was based that had just opened a week before I got there. Um, energy and environment. So if anybody's interested in renewable energy, China is the fastest growing market in the world. And you can see how in terms of money spent, just their one country was greater than everybody else that was behind them practically coming up in the top 10. Um, so they're putting a lot into wind, solar. They have big hydro obviously, but it's really the wind and the solar. Comparing electricity use, um, I give this because Again, it shows sort of what electricity hogs we are in the United States and why I go around turning off lights in this building and why uh, I keep encouraging the Energy Environmental Law Society and others, like, why do we have the lights on all night long in the library wing, the access, things like that. But we use a lot of electricity. You can see us toward the right there. We're, we're just barely second behind Canada. You can see China to the far left, India, <coughs> The average in the world is just down here. Um, and I was, this is just an exhibit A of, uh, or B or F or whatever, of uh, electricity use. So this was from my apartment window. Um, I was on the 14th floor of a building. This is looking out. This is a man-made lake. <coughs> this was this little uh, western style shopping area. Duke Kunshan is right here. And this was seven o'clock at night. And then at 5 o'clock the next morning, those are the lights. So you can see how much they turned off the lights between 7 o'clock at night and 5 in the morning. We don't do that in our country. You don't do that in Europe. It's a big difference. Um, food. Don't try to find peanut butter in the grocery store. It's really hard. Jelly. No PB&Js. Um, fresh milk, pretty hard. Uh, although it's starting to grow, they're marketing it more um, in cereal products. But 
I was interested in the fast food scene. It's like I've seen Kentucky Fried Chicken everywhere, and it is the number one outlet in China. Way double more than McDonald's. Starbucks also is growing rapidly there. So I thought, what's the deal in the U.S.? You can see Starbucks is, is big, closer to McDonald's. So what do you think the number one fast food outlet is in the United States? Subway. Damn, how'd you go? <laughs> uh, it is. Uh, but, sorry, I missed the Subway one. It's, we got like 20,000 Subways. So I said, it's not these. These are, by the way, this is at a train station. There's Kentucky Fried. These are duck necks and duck feet that you can also buy before you get on the train. Uh, but yeah, Subway, 24,800 outlets. So apparently you guys are supporting Subway pretty well here. Um, <coughs> Kentucky Fried is only 12. Facial recognition. So people actually were talking to me about that today at a meeting I was at. Um, China has a lot of video surveillance. If you are a taxi cab driver and your front seat passenger doesn't have their seat belt on, it's picked up on video, it's the taxi cab driver who will be penalized and, and assess certain points that could take away his or her license. But they have a lot of video surveillance. But don't assume we don't hear. As you can see, we have a lot of surveillance cameras and it's growing and we facial recognition. China has a significant facial recognition system. When you go through the airport, you are photographed, you are fingerprinted, and then your facial, your face is in their system. And, and they recognize you when you're in other places. The U.S. Um, is now over 120 million adults are in the State Department's system, and that's growing as well. So this is an area, the whole digital privacy issue and, and video surveillance is something that's worldwide uh, becoming more and more in play. London is a heavily surveyed city, but not as much as some of the other ones in China. Gender. You hear about the male-female ratio issue in China, it's a real issue. Um, they had the one-child policy for many, many years, and boys were preferred over girls, and that's now changed. They, they took the one-child policy off the table. However, China still has the most imbalanced male-female ratio in the world. And you can see Armenia and Azerbaijan are, are second and third. And so there are there are over um, 33 million guys who feel like they're never going to meet their woman. But the woman, women are also marrying later, as in this society, and they create some interesting social dynamics. One of which is, this is in Shanghai. This is, they then name this as People's Park, or sort of wedding park, or marriage park. Parents come here, or relatives, and they try to market their child to somebody else, so it's a little bit like matchmaking, but these umbrellas are, they put signs up or photographs up so that people walking by can sort of shop. Um, and, and this is on a Saturday or on a Sunday. Um, and again, this is just the age structure. What's interesting in China is that you'll see when I get to retirement age, uh, in terms of when people retire there, but again, in comparing the U.S. and China, you can see that there's this bulge in the middle, 25 to 54 years of age, 48, almost half the population of China is there. The U.S. is a little under 40. We have a lot more people over 65, and roughly similar in terms of, of youth. This is where the male-female uh, imbalance comes in. We have more male children than females here in the U.S., you can see. And then females outlive males pretty well over here in the U.S. But it's, it's definitely imbalanced in China. But there's this balloon in the middle in China, and they're already worrying about their social security system and how they're going to pay for people as they age. And you'll see, and again, when I get to an R, their retirement age. Guns, Mitch Robert's not here, is he? Uh, firearms. But it's interesting. Um, people don't have guns there. People do not carry guns. It's not something that is generally allowed except with limited exceptions. And same thing with big knives. Those are, are prohibited. And so um, there's some pretty serious punishment and there have been people being prosecuted lately in China for having what they call relic guns or toy guns that if they fire, they fire a bullet 
the intensity of which will not break the skin, but they're still prosecuted, it's still considered illegal. And they've raised those defenses and they've lost, and it's pretty serious uh, punishment. Hiking trails. These are typical hiking trails in China. If you go to uh, a national park or somewhere else, the trails are paved, generally speaking, not tree roots like we have here in Maine, or a lot of steps. So this was Yellow Mountain on the left. This was um, in, uh, I think, Tianmen Mountain uh, in the south over on the right. But the engineering in China is incredible. They, they say China is a country of engineers, and they really do construct things that you'll see in a moment are, are pretty incredible. Um, this is hard to see, but this is a little, see these columns here, the edge of this cliff? You walk along that. That's a, uh, that's, that's a little pathway, and, with, and this little, it's hard to see here again, but the little fencing is made to look like wood, but it's cement but they make it to look like wood. So you have to touch it to feel like, is this wood or not? Can I lean against it? Um, this is another, I said, atypical hiking trail. So what does that look like? What's that? That's an escalator going down. <laughs> so literally, and I'll show you where, where it is, it is, it runs inside of Tianmen Mountain. Um, it runs for 900 meters, so that's about 2,800 feet. There were about 20 different escalators that connect one to the other to the other, and it's, it's about a thousand foot of elevation that it goes down. So you can either walk down 999 steps, or you can take the escalator. And I decided, when else am I going to go take an escalator down a mountain? So I was, I took the escalator. Um, but it's, but think of the engineering that would go into it. But who would think, okay, I'm gonna create an escalator on a mountain, and I'm gonna do it for a thousand feet. Uh, homicides, China's a lot less than the United States. Hot water, okay, this is another tradition in China that I did not know before I got there. We, we go to our drinking fountains out here, and you put your airports and everywhere else, and you expect cold water, right? Not in China. You get hot water. They want hot water. They do not want cold water. And so I was like, why is that? And it's, as you can see, it's a, it's a history and tradition of China. And there actually are medical studies that say that drinking warm water or hot water is better for you than cold water. So keep that in mind the next time you go to the drinking cup. Um, ice cream, you know, I talked about how milk is hard to find. Ice cream is much more prevalent in a way. Um, actually invented in China, as many things were. Uh, and you can see how they, they started putting it together. But I'll show you something else on ice cream in, in just about a minute. Jail population, so we've had some talks at the law school about the US and incarceration rates and everything. And so I was curious because people have this image of China of lots of people being jailed. And, and again, you have to do comparison purposes to really get a handle on it. And you can see, first of all, this is total population. Current numbers, the US over 2 million, China 1.6. Keep in mind that they have four times as many people in China as we do. Um, so that when you then do it for 100,000, we're still up number one over at El Salvador. And then you can see that China is not even in the in the top ten. Um, so we do incarcerate a lot at a, a high rate. And this is just I put this up here. I'm not going to spend time on it, but I was curious. This is another chart I found because I always think of jails. You think of jails as people who are not prisoners, but we house a lot of prisoners in local jails. Six hundred and twelve thousand compared to the one point three million in state prisons. Um, anybody have an idea what that might be? You're not going to guess. It's, a, it's owned by a Finland company. This is in Kunshan. 773 Pi. It's an elevator testing facility. <laughs> so I, this was taken from a car. That's why it looks like it's leaning. And I saw this and I thought, what in the world is that? The tallest thing around in, in Kunshan. And they, 
they located here. Kunshan is also known as Little Taiwan. There are a lot of Taiwanese businesses there. It's the wealthiest, they call it county level city in China. So there's a lot of businesses that locate there, which is why Duke's there. So what do they call lobster in China? This is a little hard to read. They call it Boston Dragon. <laughs> now, they could at least call it name dragon, right? I mean, it, and dragons have certain powerful symbolism there, but I thought this was in a restaurant. They had that. Mooncakes. So students be, be ready on this because traditional Chinese dessert, mid-autumn, so it's usually in September, mid-September. Um, and they, uh, so they, they have something called a National Teacher's Day which is right the day before almost this holiday. And so students give teachers gifts. Keep that in mind. Um, so um, I didn't get this, but one of my colleagues did, and she does not like mooncakes, so she gave it to me. So I lugged this all the way back, but it was filled with these mooncakes, which after eating one or two, you just are done. So I give the rest away, but then some tea. So again, this is for ideas for when you give gifts to your teachers this year. <laughs> but here, if you see these on the right, haagen moon mooncakes. Um, when I was in Shanghai, I saw these long lines of people with these tents. It was like, what is going on? They order and line up to buy these haagen moon mooncakes because they're made out of ice cream, not the heavy, high-calorie substance that mooncakes usually are. So literally, in a day and night, People are lined up to buy these. Um, and then I say, so Mooncake's the music for teachers, so this is Wang Jing here. And um, I, I got one of the little flags from this. So they had a singing competition. So Anthony, be ready. This is uh, for teachers. Teachers at all the universities in the country had to compete against each other, and they were videoed. Um, because they had to sing this particular national celebration song for the 70th anniversary. So can you imagine your professors doing that? If you gave them enough gifts, maybe they would. But, um, the number nine, okay, the number nine is a powerful symbol in China as well, which I did not know until I was there. Um, so this door is in the Forbidden City in Beijing. See these little gold sort of inset balls there. There's nine across and nine rows down. The number nine is associated with the emperor and power, and you can see long-lasting eternity. Over to the right, that's not a fake picture. That was that mountain that I said had the escalator. To get up this mountain, they have this road with 99 curves. But it's only 99, because you don't want 100, and you don't want 98. It's the double nine symbol. And you can see Forbidden City was supposed to have 9,999 rooms. So I thought, I don't know if you remember the Beatles' White Album, but they have a song that keeps saying number nine, number nine, number nine, recycling. So I thought maybe John Lennon was into Chinese numerology. So I have a link there if anybody cares to figure out if Lennon was into that. But, so I told you you could walk down or take the escalator. These are the steps you would walk down, 999 of them. Um, and this cave is called Heaven's Gate, and it, it's pretty incredible. It's um, 1,200 meters above sea level, natural. And you, they, sometimes they have jets fly through it. And you'll see, I'll show you something else that, that people tries to fly through it, or does fly through it a little later. Um, obesity, I was curious, generally you don't see too many people who are obese in China, at least I didn't, so I was curious of what the rates were, and you can see that while China is lower than the U.S., it's not a lot lower, and, and it's changing. Their whole diet system is changing as there's more and more Western influence and as people have more money, and more and more people move to the city um, in China. Um, law school, so I got to talk about some law stuff. They, again, they are studying what we do here and they're adapting it to their system. So they recently uh, passed legislation that involves public interest litigation. In other words, if you think about citizen suits or standing or things for people to sue, 
It's a little different in China. And so here, this one law is, again, focusing on the environment. You can see how it's worded. Or food and drug safety. Uh, it's the people's, I can never pronounce this right, procuratorate, um, prosecutors. It's, it's state prosecutors. And they are generally the ones who bring the public interest litigation. However, they, um, you know, they can sue the state. You know, public, uh, nonprofit groups cannot sue the state. And so you can also see that one of the remedies that they can pursue is an apology, which we don't have in this country. Um, but there's a second type of public interest litigation, which is called <coughs> administrative, where you're essentially like administrative law here, those of you who have taken my class or et cetera, where you're challenging an agency decision. And again, the prosecutors who are state employees bring these cases against other essentially state organs, state entities, and, um, and, and seek remedies. And so that's their system, and, and again, it's evolving. Property rights is also interesting because there's this sort of thought process that nobody has, nobody owns property in China but the state. And that's somewhat true, and I, was, I kept trying to figure it out while I was there because people live in homes and they pass it on to their children and that. And I was trying to figure out how do they do that. And partly it's, this, it's a land lease of 70 years uh, under some of it. And so a lot of the villages, that's how it works. But this is the law, it is changing currently in China so that, um, Again, foreigners are starting to be allowed to buy a home. You can buy a house, but you buy the building, you don't necessarily own the land underneath the building. So that's part of the distinction in terms of property rights. And, and this is, again, urban, rural, sorry, I guess I didn't have the rural, but rural is a little different, and again, tends to be more of these long land leases. But China is starting to think that, gee, we might get more investment and people might be more secure if they had longer property rights interest. So they're starting to slide a little bit toward the Western system, but, but again, in terms of owning the buildings, but maybe not the land underneath. I almost forgot Q today when I was doing the alphabet, so I remember. This is uh, quartz sandstone. So this is one of the towers. They can be um, over 3,000 feet high, these sort of pillars. And uh, I'll show you a little later what these inspired, but there are thousands of these in this national park in central China. It's pretty spectacular. But here's the, the rural, sorry, the rural of ownership. You have collectively a village can own um, sort of pieces of farmland that then gets farmed but you have a 30-year contract, and now they're extending it another 30 years. And so, again, this is evolving. This was 2019. Um, so they're still dealing with how do they adapt their system to a, a, a property rights ownership system. Here's my retirement slide. See the retirement ages? So it's pretty young. Those of us who are older think it's young. Um, you young guys think it's pretty far off still, but What's interesting is, again, they're already seeing the bulge coming that I showed you, the 28 to 54 year olds, that big population bulge. So that's why they're going to move out that retirement age. In, in Europe, if you add one year to a retirement age, people go on strike and they revolt. You can see China's going to make some pretty dramatic changes in their retirement age. But life expectancy is not much less in China than here. So people retire early and they live quite long retired. And so that's a, a cost on the, on the state in terms of pensions. And also it tends to be people, they go to the city to work, and then they, when they retire, they go back to their home villages. A lot of people do. Um, now I'm going to see if this works. For our, so um, rock music in China is a little different from rock music here. So I'm walking in a park in Kunshan, and I hear this music from somewhere. And I look around, there's nobody behind me. I look to the side, I look to the front, 
and I don't see anybody, and I'm saying, where is this music coming from? And then I look down. So this is not atypical. There are other parks where you walk along and there are rocks that play music. Um, so I that, was, that was unique. And then I showed you that picture from my apartment. So um, I got there really, really late on a Wednesday night. And then so my first really night there was Thursday. I was getting ready to go to bed early because I was totally jet lagged, exhausted. Roughly 7.30, quarter to 8. And I started hearing this classical music, Western classical music. And I thought, is that somebody on my hallway I opened my door? No, it wasn't there. I'm trying to figure out where is this coming from? And then I happened to look out my window. somebody important who's in town and so they're doing this. I thought, wow, it's my first night here. <laughs> but actually it turned out that every Saturday night they do the Sound and Light show from 7.30 to 8. It was just, this was the only one that had Western classical music for it. Um, I took a lot of pictures of these things. It was sort of cool. Um, Kunshan. So the streets in Kunshan, I said they have a lot of money, pretty wide and all that. But the thing that really interested me is, you see this here? That's not for cars. That's for bicycles or motorbikes. It's as wide as our streets. This is where the cars are, over here. So, I mean, and, and it's actually not as many people drive motorbikes and bicycles as other countries I've been in, like Indonesia and Vietnam, where there's just, most people have those, and it's mobbed but they still have pretty wide bike and, and motorbike lanes. More and more, if I close my eyes and you, if you went to China and closed your eyes and looked at the cars people drive, you would generally think you were in, a, in Europe or a Western country. They don't drive the big pickup trucks and SUVs we do here, but the cars they drive are the same kind of cars if you drive a four-door car here. Very similar, European cars, American cars, um, it's not the tiny European cars you often see. Saving money. Chinese save money. Uh, you see the U.S. 7.6%, 47% in China. So they're very, very frugal, um, which means a lot of money being saved. All right, so I talked about the bar exam and the pressure for taking the bar, the low pass rate. So again, um, Juan Jing, who was here last year, has a 14-year-old daughter. She's, I think, in eighth grade, so she's going to be taking these exams to get into high school. She's in Beijing. And she literally and her classmates study seven days a week, night and day, uh, because they are studying for this exam, national exam. And, and you can see, originally, the acceptance rate was very low because there weren't that many universities at the time in China. Now it's much higher, but the schools are ranked. Peking University in, in Beijing often is considered number one, but depending on your score on this test, will tell you where, sort of what level of school you get into, which then influences what kind of job you might be able to get elsewhere. And um, again, in the interest of time, I couldn't put up too many slides on the questions, but I wanted to show you the types of things that, that students, high, you know, ninth graders, are being asked to do and see if they can pass. Um, like, what do you have a deep passion for in your soul? Choose a plant, animal, or a utensil to write about. Anybody here into forts? <laughs> so, could be an interesting essay. Or, you know, who's the most glamorous person? So some of these questions are interesting as to what's the subliminal message that the examiners are trying to get at. Um, and here was another one that I thought, Again, sort of, if you take a moment and read it in terms of the values system that they're sort of conveying.
These are not going to show up on the bar exam when you get out of here, I can, I can guarantee you. Um, but these are graded. These are evaluated, and again, this is part of, they have to do essays, they have to do an objective test, and they do a subjective test as well. And here's one more, I thought, these are Chinese ninth graders. I couldn't answer this question, I don't know how they, they were able to answer the question. But this is, this is what the China, you know, most, most Chinese students now are studying English. And, and they, the thing that was interesting to me, so when I was over there, some of the Democratic presidential uh, debate, one of them was going on, they were all watching it. They would question me the next day about all the candidates and what was said. I wasn't watching it. Um, but they, they were staying up, and it's a 12-hour time zone difference, so, uh, and they were watching it. Tourism, I mean, Chinese people are very interested in other places and other people. Uh, and so it, I was interested in comparing it with the US because we have a big tourism industry as well. And so yeah, people spend more money here than there, probably that's the cost of living. But you can see it's 11% of their GDP, five times what it is here. So it's a big part of their economy. And what was interesting to me is you see the inbound trips, people visiting, we think we have a lot of tours here, but China has more. But five billion domestic trips. Um, again, they have more people than we do, and, and we have a lot of domestic trips as well. But, so I say when they tour, what they take are these high-speed trains, which are incredible. The public transit system in China makes our public transit system, particularly in this state, look like um, a backward, way backward Stone Age economy. So they have a lot of high-speed trains, they run on time, they are very inexpensive, you know, for a couple bucks you can get from one city to another, and they, they connect almost all the cities. So Terracotta Warriors, very famous, as you know, um, over 6,000 of them in these courses and other things there, made out of terracotta. UNESCO, China has way more World Heritage Sites than we do, if you're interested in that. Uh, this was one of my students, and I, she asked me to put her in the slideshow, so I did, but I needed you. Uh, she, she was born in the Seychelles, which I had to look up to make sure I knew exactly where the Seychelles Islands were in the Indian Ocean, and then um, has been living in Sri Lanka, but that's her on the Great Wall. Um, the students were largely Chinese at Duke Kunshan, they, get, they graduate with a Duke degree as part of the attraction there. They also have master's level programs. So I was teaching in their environmental policy master's program. And so there were international students as well as Chinese in that. I've given brochures about that program to the placement office, but if anybody's interested in learning more, let me know. VPN, you can't function there without a, a VPN if you want to have access to any news outside of Chinese news. Uh, However, having said that, even though I had two different VPN services, um, it's not easy. And technically, they're illegal. So people have been getting prosecuted for it. And one problem I found constantly, including late at night when I was trying to do my legal work in the United States, was this signal on my computer saying, nope, can't connect. And then you sit there and watch the circle go round and round and round for quite a while. Almost done. Walls, the Great Wall. We talk about the wall, border wall of Mexico. Um, it's pretty long already. President Trump hasn't built that much more. The Great Wall was over 13,000 miles, and it was built many, many, many years ago. And nobody's cutting it or cutting through it, unlike the current wall. Um, WeChat. Anybody who's been to China, if you're trying to go to China. You have to get, you can download it on your phone. It's like WhatsApp on steroids, is what I call it. It's incredible. You, you pay with it, at least I couldn't, but people do use it to pay, WeChat pay, um, text. So I'm still in touch with my students and faculty over there from here every day. Um, you can send documents, uh, you can do phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. And it's free. Um, White Rabbit, so in the US and Europe, White Rabbit means on what's on the left. In China, it means this candy called White Rabbit, uh, made out of Shanghai 
it's pretty tasty, but everything is wrapped. It's, it's a little, so you unwrap this outside paper, but it's, it's, it's covered in rice paper. Let's try to peel it off, it doesn't peel off, you're supposed to eat it. So, um, it's pretty good. Xylophone was invented in China, we knew, 2000 BC. Um, Yellow Mountain, if you've heard of Yellow Mountain, it's also called Wanshan Mountain. Again, it looks like that other uh, peak that I showed you, the quartz sandstone, it's slightly different rock. And this is the national park I mentioned. So if you look at that and you see all these pillars and there are thousands of them, does that remind you of any movie? In whispers. It was Avatar. So, so the director, James Cameron, was inspired. So now they've marketed the national park <coughs> as the Avatar Park. <laughs> Tourism has, has jumped up the floating mountains of the Avatar. So uh, just to conclude, so for me, the best part of my experience in China were the people. And, and students and faculty. So this was a field trip I led. Uh, we did a bus trip. So these were students, some couple faculty and some staff. And you can see they're wicked good marketers. So that everywhere you go, they do Kunshan banners. But so this was a coastal wind farm. There's a couple turbines you can see. With the, this was office buildings. And then we went to a coal fire plant. So China, and again. I have to do another talk or you take my course, bridge course, but um, everybody thinks China only burns coal. They do burn a lot of coal. They use a lot of coal, but that, interestingly, not much left, not much more than we do uh, in terms of fossil fuels. And so this was a clean, clean tech, so to speak, uh, low emission coal fired plant, which the stacks are, are actually pretty clean. And people live on site, so the workers live in dorms, they have a big swimming pool, pool tables, a huge basketball court. Um, this was my last class there, these were some of my students uh, from Philippines, Singapore, um, Kashka wasn't there, Sri Lanka, most of them again Chinese, and, and the classrooms were, were great, of course. Uh, and I. I close with this. Uh, she was a sophomore in Munster. She went on the bus trip. That's how I met her. She's from Mongolia. And she's from a village of 200 people. Her parents never went past elementary school. And she um, went through high school in Mongolia. She's now at Duke Munchan as a sophomore. She'll be going to Duke next year. And wicked bright. Really a great personality. And I just thought, how cool is it that she was able to, and is doing what she's doing in the past, she's doing it on. So remember I showed you the 99 mountains and I showed you that cave and I said jets fly through it. Anybody ever seen wingsuit stuff in action? So people put these on, inflate them, and then jump off mountains and cliffs. And so, um, and they try, to, they try to fly through that cave. And so when you, when you Google it, you'll find some people make it and some people don't. But, uh, but they have a competition, so they had a world championship there. Uh, and so that, I saw a lot of these photos, but that's not me. But we do have China students here and in the room today at Maine Law School. So I really encourage all, all other Maine students. Uh, and Yanju, who's here, who was here last year, uh, helped me make connections. It's worth reaching out to people and, and not only being hospitable, but learning from them. So it's, it's a good cross-cultural way of doing things. And that's it. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you guys all so much for coming. Because we're out of time, Professor Phelan can certainly take more questions out in the lobby. And I hope that you all join us next week for the final faculty speaker series event with Professor Smith.